Hola y bienvenidos a otro episodio de mi canal de YouTube Español por Dentro. Estoy aquí después de mucho tiempo porque estuve un poco ocupado, pero estoy aquí con otra invitada muy especial. Hoy vamos a hablar de, del deporte de fútbol en América Latina con una profesora de los Estados Unidos, Brenda Elsie. Brenda, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Bueno, Brenda habla español, claro, pero yo pensaba que en el interés de que este video uh, pueda ser uh, escuchado por mucha gente que, que no sepa hablar español, sería mejor hacer esta entrevista en inglés. So that is why, uh, Brenda, we're going to do this interview in English with you. So let me introduce Brenda Elsie to all of you. Brenda Elsie is a historian, writer and scholar whose uh, work focuses on the intersection of sports, politics, and society in Latin America. She has made significant contributions to the field through her research, writing, and teaching, particularly in the areas of gender, race, and nation nationalism in sports history. Brenda is perhaps best known for her book, Citizens and Sportsmen, Football and Politics in 20th Century Chile, about which we are going to speak um, today in the chat. Uh, which offers a nuanced exploration of how football has both reflected and shaped uh, Chilean national identity throughout the 20th century. Through meticulous research and analysis, she delves into the ways in which football clubs, players and fans have been intimately entwined with political movements, regimes and social dynamics in Chilean history. Uh, well, there's a lot more to talk about, Brenda, but in the interest of time, we will head straight into the question. So, Brenda, my first question to you is, um, what inspired you to write uh, the book Citizens and Sportsmen, Football and Politics in 20th Century Chile? Honestly, I was more interested in Chilean political history than sports history, per se. Um, so at the time, I was a graduate student in the 1990s. And like most graduate students, I didn't have any money. Uh, so I was living in a a barrio called Barrio República in Santiago. Mm -hmm. And in that neighborhood, there are the headquarters of unions and sports clubs. And I was listening to people arguing late into the night in suits, um, invariably men in that moment. And uh, I just was interested in like, what happens when you have a democracy that doesn't have the markers of what we think a democracy has to have economically it that maintains eight political parties you know that could imagine being elected that are viable political parties what does that do to popular culture and is that produced by a popular culture is there something that's different about football in a place like that and is there something different about the like politics of football so that that that's sort of where it started and and that was my dissertation and then um and then I turned it into a book uh years later it's different but yeah it that was the basis wonderful um and if you talk about um you know politics and football in Chile uh, especially during your research uh, Brenda so how did you come to focus on this this intersection of politics and and football Well, I was surprised that no one had done it before, honestly. There, at the time, there was a lot of literature about the role of civic associations, people like sociologist Robert Putnam, other social scientists that had been interested in, you know, what makes a healthy democratic space. And civic associations were one of them, you know, whether they be the YMCA or, um, you know, a knitting circle or a book club. And I would say that this has persisted in, in global literature, right? This interest in um, civic associations. But the most popular civic association in Chile uh, was football clubs, were football clubs. And so uh, that was where I sort of centered for that question. And again, just because I had seen the passion with which people were able to dedicate their time and their energy to this practice. And so I, I just got really interested in it. And I said, how did no one write this before? <laughs> Why has no one written this? Um, and then I started to do research and I was very fortunate to have grants. I lived in Chile for several years and um, just went to the library every day and started just 
reading about these people. And yeah, I found it fascinating. Wonderful. Um, talking about football, uh, Brenda, uh, how does football, according to you, serve as a lens through which um, we can understand uh, the broader political and social dynamics in, in Chile during the 20th century? Yeah, well, the first argument I make is that football is one of the few spaces where men of different class backgrounds associate and socialize. And that that's very important, having those not explicitly political spaces, even though they are always political, is an important way to encourage dialogue and social relationships and um, and, and also kind of creative cultural production uh, that that unifies a group of people behind the idea that Chile was a democracy. And there's a lot of debate about that. That's like the number one debate in Chilean history before 1973 is, you know, how democratic is it? And um, what I'm trying to argue in the book is that the belief in democracy was very important for the functioning of actual democracy. So you have to think that you are a democratic people to act like one. Mm -hmm. And that football was very good for that because those social spaces um, allowed this kind of backdoor way to talk about politics, that that was a very healthy for Chilean society. Now, that was a space that women were very excluded from in until the 1960s. So so it's not that everybody can belong, but certainly a wider swath of the population than before. Well, that, that, that's quite interesting. And uh... If you talk about your research, uh, Brenda, what primary sources or methodologies did you did you utilize in your research for this book? Oh my gosh, it was, it was so exhausting and exhaustive. I wouldn't recommend anyone try it. Uh, I did so. I I conducted a lot of oral histories with older players and club members. Um, that was a disaster. Mm -hmm. They were totally uninterested. They were like, why are you asking me this? Um, we never did very well. So I would be interested, for example, in an anarchist club. Like, what did your rules look like compared to the club that is associated with the conservative party? They're like, I don't remember. We have the same rules. You know, they did not really want to be interviewed. I did surveys. I went to clubs, I went to league, they, also disastrous. The easiest way for me um, and most effective was to painstakingly read through um, sports pages, sports magazines like Estadio, which was a very important one. El Grafico in Argentina also circulated widely in Chile. And then also because the book has to do with a lot of immigration, um, going through immigrant newspapers. So I do a comparison of Audax Italiano, which is the Italian club in Chile, Palestino, which is the Palestinian club, which in that time is not exactly Palestinian, but is a combination of Arab Chileans, mostly Christian, which are what would be today Palestine, Lebanese, and Syrian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so looking at that, and then a comparison of those two teams with the Spanish club Unión Española. So I went through and read basically their circulars, like their flyers, their rules, their reglamentos, so these bylaws that they, each club is is constructing. Um, it's really, it's kind of boring, but the findings are interesting. I'm sure that, that that for you it would not have been since since you're so passionate about it and and that's what I think research is is all about. It's it's all about the passion that uh, with which you work. Um, well, well, Brenda, you you talked about uh, people not very keen to give you interviews. So, um, one question that that I wanted to ask you uh, around this theme was that uh, could you discuss any unexpected or particularly enlightening discoveries that you made uh, during the course of your research, which you'd like to share with us? I mean, I think one of the most interesting things is the way in which different types of masculinities were competing in the 20th century through football. The way in which um, ideas about what it meant to be an ideal man 
were being argued and discussed through football and how they intersected with race. So Brazil, Peru, they always stand in as the black other in Chilean literature. And so how do these Chileans make a claim for whiteness while also claiming to be mestizo or part indigenous? And that that always was this very sort of tricky, um, you know, road to walk down, right? <laughs> and that racism is just absolutely virulent in and persistent in Chile in ways that I think they're really confronting today with massive Haitian immigration to Chile in that really challenges you know, and football players like Bosajor, who's mm -hmm. Haitian, Chilean, Mapuche, uh, that him as a player, his very identity speaks to something that's not really very often discussed uh, in Chile. Uh, in fact, one of the things I showed was in the 1962 World Cup when Chile made this uh, guidebook that it sent around the world, right? Like, this is Chile and this is why you should come and visit us. And in it, they said, Chile is the most homo racially homogenous country um, in all of the Americas. And, um, you know, it's, it, it sort of perpetuates through football this, this idea that there's one kind of Chilean and uh, the dictatorship really sort of renewed that in the 1980s with textbooks that said things like um, African people could not survive in Chile because it was too cold you know, just ridiculous, uh, you know, eugenics type of material. So so I guess what's interesting is how these different men were sort of debating this in a place that wasn't really ostensibly a place to do that, right? It's not a school, it's not public policy, but it's an informal space uh, to challenge those ideas and to propagate those ideas. Fascinating, um, Brenda, what you talk about uh, this and uh, we're talking about um, again, you know, football and its relation to to society. Um, I'd like to ask that in what ways did football both reflect and shape the Chilean national identity throughout uh, the twentieth century? I mean, I think it reflects a lot of things. Like, for example, it certainly reflects longstanding sexism, um, and and that's really important, and yet. Uh, it's a place where women carve space to produce social change over time. Same with immigration, right? Uh, Palestino, originally in the Palestinian club, originally tries to participate in the Chilean league before professionalization in the late 1920s. They're, uh, they withdraw because they're violently attacked every time they try to play. People throw rocks at them. They um, yell at them, you know, um, slurs, ethnic slurs. And uh, they, call, they call them the dogs of Constantinople, uh, which is a horrible phrase from a book uh, by Nicolas Palacios, who is a Chilean writer that Pinochet really loved. And then they withdraw. They withdraw completely. Then they re-enter in the 1940s. And when they re-enter in the 1940s, again, it reflects the fact that the Arab Chilean community had successfully integrated in social spaces and in economic and political spheres in a number of ways. There are prominent Arab Chileans that are both on the left and on the right when Salvador Allende is elected, you know, really span. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also produces change because in a way it said, OK, yes, uh, Arab Americans or Arab Chileans have successfully gained economic status, but they are also culturally Chilean. Chilean. And so it, it, it produces a shift in the way people saw uh, Palestinian Chileans, Lebanese Chileans, you know, whichever sort of do not like now country they weren't those nation states at the time, but as they transition. Mm -hmm. And today, if you watch Palestino, who just competed in Copa Libertadores, you will see that they are constantly raising right now um, consciousness about solidarity with Gaza. 
And so they've persisted in producing change, but they also are a reflection of the role of those Arab Chileans. And because they were Christian, it was an easier integration for them than the Muslim Arab Chileans. So yeah, it's always reflecting and producing, you know. It can okay. totally reflect, because think about it. Half of Chileans are women. So football cannot be a mirror. <laughs> you know, it's like just at the basic level, it's not a reflection like that. But it's more, I say in the book, it's a reflection like a carnival. When you go and you look in the mirror and there's pieces of reality, but it's distorted. Fascinating. And when we talk about the different uh, political regimes in Chile, uh, such as the, the Allende government and the Pinochet dictatorship, um, how did these uh, regimes, uh, Brenda, influence the, the football culture and the administration? So Allende's presidency is in, in some part, not large part or majority part, but is in some part um, supported by amateur Chilean football, uh, especially the men who had been involved in unions and labor unions. When Pinochet comes to power, he knows very well that this is a kind of pillar of leftist culture. And he bans elections in football clubs immediately. And that is really important because he replaces many of the leaders of the clubs and the leagues with military uh, men who are loyal to him. So essentially, it totally changes the administration from a place of like democratic debate to completely authoritarian. And it really, it, it really is terrible for Chilean football. They perform terribly. There, many of the players leave, they're exiled, or they choose self-exile. Carlos Caselli being one of the most famous that leaves immediately his own mother being imprisoned um, under Pinochet. So the climate is not, it, it, and certainly amateur football just withers on the vine, right? This very vibrant, very um, uh, festive culture on Sunday mornings where there's food and there's music and there's community celebrations. That completely stops with curfews and Pinochet not allowing gatherings. So, you know, that has long term impacts in in Chile until this day. I think it's very hard to rebuild that. Okay. It's interesting what you talk about in this, like the examples that you give, uh, Brenda. And um, if you talk about um, the, the clubs themselves, the football clubs, the players and fans, um, what role do do these groups of people or you talk about clubs, the organizations, they play in political activism and resistance movements during uh, the times of political turmoil? So it's very ambivalent. Um, a club like Colo Colo, I'll just use that as an example. Colo Colo is the most popular uh, club in Chile. And it's founded in 1925 by physical education teachers. You will see if you look at them that they have um, an indigenous mascot, which I would strongly object to <laughs> if I were them, but I, I'm not. I've presented in the club and tried to explain why I don't think it's a great idea. But Colo Colo is the most popular club in Chile. Mm -hmm. It is also fairly left-wing. Um, Carlos Caselli, who I mentioned earlier, played there. Many prominent players uh, supported Allende very vocally. When the dictatorship arrives, um, Colo Colo does not have a stadium. It had used various stadiums, including the National Stadium, which became a concentration camp in 1973, where people were tortured and murdered. And uh, Pinochet says, uh, you know how to solve this is I'm going to build them a stadium. And so you get Monumental, which is where Colo Colo plays today. If you can ever see a game there, it's gorgeous. It's right in the Andes Mountains. It's Even if you just watch it on Copa Libertadores, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful stadium. And uh, as long as the pollution is not blocking the mountains, um, it's gorgeous. So Colo Colo, which identifies as a place of resistance to the dictatorship, has a really nebulous uh, relationship to it because they definitely take that money. 
And uh, they take that money. They have that stadium. Because it's so popular, the right wing in Chile tries to buy it. So for a while, Sebastián Piñera, who was the conservative president of Chile, buys half of Colo Colo because it's, it's in bankruptcy in the 1990s. It's a total, um, I don't know another word, S-H-I-T show. Um, it's a it's a bad it's a bad scene, you know, and uh, it's a disaster they would say in Chile. And so, basically, now what you have is Colo Colo being divided between half of it being a social club that's owned by like members, and half of it being owned by this incredibly neoliberal uh, bureaucrat from the dictatorship. So that is in a nutshell, what happens, you know, it becomes a real site of struggle between these two forces today, even today, the gender commission in Colo Colo is incredibly progressive, making the stadium safe for women, fielding women's teams, pushing forward on trans rights, LGBTQ rights. Um, it continues to do amazing work. Um, and yet, they have to go to the board meetings and struggle with the guys on the total opposite side. Uh, and so it's, I would say, you know, that sort of continues that that legacy in that way. Interesting. Um, Brenda, we, you, in your title, it, it talks about the time period of the 20th century. Um, uh, however, now in the 21st century, how do you think uh, the relationship between football and politics in Chile has evolved from... The previous century now to this century i think very unfortunately the amateur system has not made a comeback from the 20th century it has not um rebounded from the dictatorship and so there's a lot of funding a lot of uh, resources that go to the top division of men's professional clubs rather than trying to um, start at the youth level or use even some of FIFA development money that could be used to really, um, you know, enliven the youth division. So, so one of the problems is if you saw the FIFA arrests in 2015, um, Hadwe, who was the uh, president of the Chilean um, football Association was under arrest, is maybe still under arrest, I don't know, in house arrest in Miami, um, and destroyed like all the computer evidence of like basically like they're stealing money that's meant for uh, you know, uh, under under served youth programs. And uh, unfortunately, we have not seen a real leader of Chilean football that has come forward, that has the initiative and the popularity and the know-how to combine that enthusiasm of uh, youth in Chile with a kind of, um, you know, best business practices. And so in some, in some sense, it's, it's sort of a tough situation right now because they're still reeling from that 2015 then you had COVID, et cetera. Chile is still trying to rewrite its constitution right now. That's kind of a big deal that is like, you know, means anyone is really active at the community level is thinking about those things. So yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And I think you see the men's team's performance reflect that. If you look at the men's well, women have tried to rebound with grassroots help, with grassroots organizations, not because the Federation has helped them at all. Um, but so, yeah, unfortunately. It's, it's in, uh, rather it's in spite of the system rather than because of the system, yeah. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. So, uh, Brenda, we're coming towards the end of this interview. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. One is... Um, how do you hope uh, you know this this book can contribute to our understanding of both the Chilean history and the broader relationship between uh, sports and politics? If you can throw some light on that, I mean, I think one of the most universal arguments I'm trying to get at is that um, mixing politics and sports is not only inevitable, but it's not a bad thing. 
it, it it's not only is it impossible to escape when people tell you that you shouldn't make sports and politics, they're making a political argument. So too late, but <laughs> you've already done it. Um, you know, saying you have no politics is a politics. Sorry, but that's the way, you know, that's the way political discourse works. Uh, to say I'm apolitical and I don't participate is a political decision. So you can't. Sorry. And so I'm trying to, I hope this book contributes to kind of a uh, hopeful look at the ways in which civic associations can play important roles in uh, it being intermediaries between people, local people and the national level and the way in which they can promote dialogue around politics in, again, through the back door, not like a, a frontal engagement with I like this candidate, you like this candidate, but instead, like, what do you really think football's for? What is it? What should it be for? Should it be to enrich um, these people and to send people to Barcelona or should it be something different? And I'm hoping that people in Chile would read it and find some nostalgia for a moment in which football was a very democratic engine. Great. Uh, well, my last question to you, Brenda, is about the upcoming uh, football World Cup that's going to happen in 2036 <laughs> in uh, USA, Mexico, and Canada. Now, Mexico is an interesting country. I think that'll be uh, the first country to actually have hosted uh, the World Cup thrice. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Going beyond Chile, and and what do you think? Um, Mexico being one of the hosts, um, uh, what what does it do to the overall um, picture of Latin America um, uh, in terms of football, uh, Brenda? Do you think that that something something much more monumental can come out through through this hosting of uh, by one of the South American countries for the continent in general? I mean, I think Mexico to. To have it at Estadio Azteca, which is also, by the way, with where the largest women's football tournament took place in 1971, which filled Estadio Azteca with 100,000, over 100,000 spectators, is uh, great. I mean, Mexico is a, like has the facilities, does not have to invest a bazillion dollars. It has the transportation. I'm a little disappointed they don't have more of the tournament um, yeah. because... Well, well, again, Brenda, I was I was thinking of this question yeah. last year that, you know, when we talk about not mixing politics and spokes, uh, probably the, the allocation of games also hints at, at, uh, at, at a political angle, you know, in a way. I mean, when you look at it, like USA obviously being a, the, the biggest of the, of the three countries um, uh, has probably... Um, a sort of a fair um, right to host most of the games. But then if you look at, I think, I, I don't know what the schedule is there, but probably I'm assuming that Mexico is not hosting any of the knockout games, so which probably attract more attention than the group games. So do you think that, they, that, that again, politics is at play when you look, when you decide the allocation of games? Oh, yeah. I mean, the idea is very obvious that... Um... FIFA is hoping to expand the U.S. audience. The Mexican audience is convinced, you know, and Canadian audience likes hockey. So I think, I think, yeah, it's a, that's, it's a clear sort of, in this case, maybe more business um, or profit motive than an overt political motive. But, um, you know, that that's the idea is to bring in huge gate receipts. I mean, why on earth, how could you justify having it in Kansas City? And like, don't think I don't like the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest. But um, but to say, well, we're we're gonna have it there or or something is obviously a ploy to try to and not ploy makes it sound nefarious. I think it's 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 more obvious. You're trying to, you know, um spread your viewership and uh and have you know, soccer's been not one of the top three sports in the United States. You have Messi here. You have, I mean, this was before Messi was coming here, but an eye to the MLS growing was already very clear. And um, I think they're, they're excited. I also think it does make sense. I will say, like in the case of Mexico and in the case of Vancouver, um, to have it in places where you don't need, 
you know, billions and billions of dollars. These stadiums host mega events every weekend. You know, you don't, it's not hopefully going to be as environmentally damaging as 2022. Hopefully labor um, practices can also be better than 2022. Um, so, I mean, yet to be seen, uh, but, but it, I think it makes sense in a number of ways not to start over and build stadiums where no one will come. These are stadiums where people go on the regular. So there's politics at play, but I guess I take, I take some comfort in the fact that there's not going to be these white elephant stadiums all over that will be used as like, I don't know, parking lots, um, in the future. Fascinating. I mean, there's there's so much more to talk to you, Brenda, about so many other books that that you have written. But uh, hopefully, you'll give us some time on uh, on on this show some other day to talk about that. But uh, thank you so much, Brenda, for uh, for being here and uh, talking about your book. And um, yeah, and I hope to to be in touch with you. Sí, gracias. Y la próxima vez podríamos hacerlo en español. Claro, la próxima vez lo haremos en español. Muchas gracias, Brenda. Y gracias, gracias a, mi, a mi público por ver este episodio. Hasta el siguiente capítulo de Español por Dentro. Chao. Chao.